Hey everybody, good evening. Uh, we're officially the halfway mark, over the halfway mark. We have four weeks left. This is week five of Advanced uh, Programming with Java here at Portland State University. Um, got some good stuff tonight. So uh, we'll start off with some Prime Minister's questions, talk about uh, how the last week has been. And it's always an interesting week because, uh, as you know, you can see here from the, uh, from the schedule, there's a lot of stuff that was due, right? People finishing up their cones, people finishing up the, uh, the Project 3, um, all sorts of good stuff. And so I'm happy to answer any questions that you have uh, about that, anything that came up. Um, we'll also spend uh, some time in class together um, uh, completing our discussion about Project 4. We saw a lot of it last week. We learned about the servlet. We learned about using Mojito to run the, uh, to, to, to write unit tests. We can review a little bit of that, but I'd really like to break ground on, or at least start talking about some of the other side of it, what to deal on the, how to do with the client to your, uh, the, the, the web application. Um, and then we're going to spend the remainder of the class doing some mob programming. So this is another style of group um, group programming, um, where uh, instead of just two people, you have multiple people. We'll have groups of four or five or something. And I think it's uh, it's an interesting contrast to the pair programming in terms of the dynamic of the discussion, and then also um, you know what what the, what the group can get done. So anyway, lots of good stuff happening tonight. Um, but first, I want to open it up for for questions. So uh, you know, now we're here halfway through the course. What can I tell you? What are some of the things that remain on on your mind? Any um, leftover uh, questions about the cones, the kind of stuff you saw there? Anything about the project? Any feedback that you uh, that you have for me? Yes. It's a little bit earlier to talk about the final exam. Yep. I mean, I will say, in just for, for planning purposes and stuff, it will occur during class. It will be uh, the class time. However, it is administered via uh, Canvas, and so you can attend remotely um, or uh, uh, or be here in the classroom. So yeah. So um, yeah, and, and we'll talk about the content of it. I don't know in week seven, um, but you know, it's it's not it's not going to be much of a surprise. What other questions do people have? We can talk about, we can ask, yeah, feel free to ask questions about program four now. Um, and although my answer might be like, we'll get to that later tonight, but what, what questions do you have about pro project four, the, uh, the rest? Uh, REST API. Yeah, if the server isn't running, then I think it's one of the error cases. Oh, where are the error cases? Oops. Yeah, it's a uh, error handler, yeah. Uh, connection to the server cannot be established. Uh, correct. If, if yeah, it, it doesn't matter why. So it could be that the you know the the server isn't running at all on the expected port, or that it's running on a different port. Client doesn't know. All the client knows is that it tries to you know reach out and it uh, gets ghosted. Is that what the kids say these days? I don't know. Oh, if you have search and the phone call info, uh, like all, yeah, with all of the um, times and everything, or the, the phone calls and everything like that, phone numbers and everything like that, I'm not going to test that, so I don't know. You can call it an error, you can do something else. It, it probably should be an error, but... Well, actually, you can never have. Actually, that's a good point. Print and search don't make any sense either because when you search, you're not adding a phone call. So again, I'm not going to test it. So you can do whatever you want, right? I don't think that would make sense. Yeah. So I think print is only appropriate when you have all the command line arguments. So I'm trying to find find things. Let's put over two pages. That's ugly. I said there isn't a print option. Oh, there is a print option. Yep. So it totally is. Yep. 
That's right. I need that. Yeah, the date format um, will, uh, or um, the date format for print is still short. The date format on the command line is the same, and might as well use the same format in your text file. Yeah. No, I'm not going to change the date format again. Sorry, what was that? Well, okay, so that's a good point. Did I say text file? I meant text format because uh, just, uh, just uh, to be clear, in Project 4, there are you aren't writing any files. All of the phone bills are stored in memory um, on, on the server referenced by the servlet. And the data exchange format between the client and the server is your text format, though. That can be whatever you want. However, as we saw in the discussions, um, you want to retain the four-digit year so it can't be short. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's making sense now. Hey, good. The format of the printy print does not need to change. So yes, duration should still be there. I mean, so you, you know, uh, most likely, you will not need to change the uh, it, it, you will not need to change the format of your text file, the format of your pretty print, and depending on how you uh, structured your your pretty printer and your your text number, text parser, all that kind of stuff, you might not need to change the classes at all. So, if, if you're like, oh wait, all this works, I think if, if you follow the pattern that was there, where you like take in the writer or whatever, then it should all work. Search is the only option that does the pretty print. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure more stuff will come up. Good. Well, that was, that was actually a great segue into Project 4. Um, oh, so a question. Uh, so we just implemented the two-digit year to waste time. Uh, waste time, waste time. No, to learn a, to, to learn an important lesson about date format dot short and date formatting. Okay, let's move on to uh, let's move on to project four. So I think everybody's here now. I will close the chat so I have more. Uh, space. Let's keep those up there. Okay, so as you may recall, uh, Project 4 um, is the next evolution, I'm looking for a picture, of our uh, of our phone bill project, where now you have two Java programs that talk to each other. One, uh, the one on the right here, is the, is the web server. Um, it's uh, running what's called the Jetty Web Container, and what that web container contains are Java web applications. In this case, it's a phone bill uh, web application that is created by the, the phone bill-web uh, Maven project, that web application, that WAR file, contains uh, a servlet, which is a Java object that responds to HTTP requests called phone bill servlet. So that's sitting there uh, running in one process. And then this is a, uh, a web server. Um, and uh, uh, and so then it will respond to any HTTP request really from any source. So as we saw last week, and we'll poke at it again here, um, you can access it via uh, a web browser uh, by hitting the URLs there. And as we'll really dig into tonight, you can uh, call from another Java program. So you can make HTTP, HTTP requests from a Java program um, using uh, some code called the Phone Bill Rust Client that we'll see more about tonight. Question came in, is expected to use map key value while using dumper class for project four? I don't know. Um, if you find yourself using the map class in your dumper, I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. I haven't really thought about it. Um, we, you'll see that we will use the map class uh, like in the dictionary to store the dictionary. So you might find yourself using a map uh, to store multiple phone bills, for instance, in project four. So we've got these, 
uh, two programs. They talk to each other using an HTTP request, which is uh, well, which goes over a port and a socket. And while we don't talk too much about low-level network, not low-level, actually application level, but we don't talk about like socket-level um, uh, interprocess communication in in this class. Um, the HTTP uh, stuff is all built on top of sockets. So let's just qu quickly walk through what the um, how the, the program works and what. The I'm sorry, I have a quick question. Oh yeah, sure, totally. Um, do we have to somehow reference our original phone bill project in the phone bill web project? Does it auto import it? Do we have to copy the files yeah. in? How do we do that? Excellent questions. Oops, which no one in the classroom can hear. I'm sorry about that. I will uh, let's say have you on. Let's see here, speaker. I think that one. Uh, yes. So, so sorry, who, who asked that question? Me, Alana. Oh, hey, Alana. Thanks. Um, yeah, I didn't have the participants view up. Um, so the question was, uh, do we need to, uh, how, how do we get the, all, all the classes from project three into project four? Yes, copy them, right? So just copy the, um, the, the code, both the, you know, the stuff from source uh, uh, source main and source tests and integration tests too, if you need them, um, into uh, from the phone bill project into the phone bill web project. Uh, yeah, there's no we, sort of auto import. I didn't want to set up anything that fancy. Are we going to overwrite things like Pretty Printer in the new project, or do we sort of like copy the code from the old Pretty Printer right into now. the file without overwriting? Um. You know, that, that pretty printer that I include, and I might have a, a sample text dumper and text writer also, I can't remember. Um, th those are just examples. And so then uh, feel free to overwrite it. Um, but then, uh, yeah, hey, if there's something about, uh, you know, the way that the example ones uh, are, are structured that you want to leverage, feel free to leverage that too. Um, but yeah, I think it's probably just easy just to copy it in and, uh, and then reuse it from there. Alex? Yeah, no? Okay. 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 Okay, so over here in the right hand, so I, I have two terminals up, both running on my local machine. And so over here on the right, I'm going to run uh, Jetty Run with Maven. And what this does, this starts up the Jetty web, web application server and uh, we'll build, actually, sorry, it'll build the project first. And so that means compiling all the test co code. And instead of making an executable jar after running the unit tests, what it does is it creates a war file, a web archive, which contains the source code, uh, the, 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 the Java code that you need, like your servlet and all the code that the servlet uses. It also uh, contains some configuration files with the web.xml, which you don't need to change, but if you go and watch the lecture, you'll see that there's lots of things inside this web application. It starts up Jetty and deploys that web application to Jetty. So now Jetty's running. And so now if we go and we visit localhost 8080 uh, phone bill, it serves up this HTML file, uh, which here again is just for demonstration purposes. If you want to modify it to, uh, to, to work with your project, that helps you develop it, go for it, but it's not something that you'll submit and it's not something it'll be graded on. Um, this is a, a simple a, a series of HTML forms that allow you to interact with, well, to send HTTP requests off to the server. And so as we saw last time, you can do various things. You can, you know, look for uh, the, the word, you know, Java, and uh, it returns a 404 because it wasn't found. Similarly, you can uh, sing while you're dancing out up the stairs to go to bed. Um, a deer, a female deer. Um, and that uh, and that will then define the, uh, the the word definition pair on the on the server. So half of the application is the server side, which is the thing that, that contains the logic. Uh, so again, out of the box, it contains a, uh, a dictionary application. Uh, you'll, of course, evolve this to be a, the phone bill application. Um, and then uh, if you go back to our picture, we've also got the, the left-hand side, the client side. So this is another Java program that interacts with your server. And so over here, it is a, uh, is 
this cute little jar called Foam Bill Client. And it uh, this is this is a simple command line uh, program, um, and so then it just takes a host port word and definition. So the local uh, the host is going to be localhost, which means the current machine that it's running on, and the port is 8080. Is that right? Yep, it's 8080. Oh, and by the way, you knew it was running on 8080 because over here it tells you what address it binds to. So uh, there's 8080. And so when you run with these two arguments, it's the same thing as uh, if we go back here as uh, just going to this URL, so slash phone bill slash calls, it'll print out the entire contents of the dictionary. And uh, there you go. The, it's, it's the same thing. So you end up with a dictionary that contains one word, and uh, there it is. And so similarly, you can use the, uh, the, 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 the phone bill client to add uh, new stuff. So, oops. so a blue is a bear. And you can add that from the client. Now, if I refresh this page and make that same request, now my new word will show up because the server now is maintaining those two uh, those two words in the dictionary. So, just make sure to remember what the program does. It's important to keep in mind as we look at the code. It's pretty simple, um, uh, which is on purpose, right? It's just to get you started, and then your job with Project Four is to build up the application so they can deal with the phone bill. Okay. Now, if we go and look at the code, uh, as uh, as you'll as you may recall, or maybe you've completely blocked it out by now, there's something called the phone bill servlet, which is uh, which again responds to the HTTP request. And we dug into this last week, so we talked about what do get and do post does. We talked about how this code reads the parameters off the request and does certain things with them. Right? It looks for the word and then it has logic based on that, and then it writes back to the response. Um, so, and this is what a servlet does, right? It takes information from the request, processes it, and then returns whatever you're asking for. So whether it is like performing an operation, like making a dictionary entry, or whether or not it's, you know, creating a graphic and returning it to you, all of this is abstracted out using the servlet API and then is made concrete by your implementation of the servlet. Now, because I'm a, a big fan of testing, we talked about how to test this. Um, and uh, because the servlet itself depends on objects like this HTTP servlet request and this HTTP servlet response, uh, the API is a little bit more difficult to test than what we've seen so far. And so then we're leveraging a library called Mockito to create what are called mock objects that allow you to send the, the code under test, so the do get method over here, send something which technically is an HTTP uh, servlet request, but won't be the same complex HTTP servlet request that is, um, that, that is sent to this method in, uh, when it's run in Jetty. And this is fine, because your method doesn't care. It just cares that it has some object that implements the HTTP server request method. And so when you test it, that some object is one of these mock objects that you can use methods like when and then return to sort of program uh, the, the objects to behave the way that you want so that when you interact with those mock objects, you get the response that you want. So here, when we, um, uh, when we make a request that has uh, no, no parameters, um, we, uh, we, 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 we say that, oh, and uh, from a, um, a server that doesn't contain any dictionary entries, then nothing should be written to the print writer. And that's what it is that we uh, assert there. And we use the verify method to do. Oh, do I have this example code uploaded to GitHub? Yes, and it comes, uh, this is what comes in the box. So like when you create your project, you get all of this code. But this code is in my repository, and so I will go, um, Look at that. It's well, let's not get started. It's github.com, Portland State, Java, summer 2022. <laughs> yep, so all this is in Phone Bill Web. Yep, that's all there. Yeah, and so then feel free to look at it on GitHub, check it out, um, you know, do your own things with it. It's all. It's all for you. Okay. So last time uh, we, boy, we, we really, we, we dug into the, the server code. We used the debugger, as you may recall, to attach to the, uh, to the server program. 
um, and then we uh, would hit a breakpoint like here at the beginning of do get, and we could step through the uh, the code to see uh, what was being executed, what values were being passed in, what the values of uh, different variables were, all sorts of really great stuff. Um, and so then I'm not inclined to start redoing that tonight, but are there any questions about what we covered last week in terms of what a servlet is, how to interact with it, any of the Mojito stuff? Okay. Well, this week we're going to focus on the other side of the equation. We're going to focus on the uh, the phone bill client and what it does. So, if we look at our architectural diagram in the assignment, you'll see that there is a project four class that uses something called a phone bill rest client to interact with the the web container. And basically, what the phone bill rest client does is it provides it provides an interface. Okay, how, how to put this? Um, maybe maybe I just showed you the code. So, um, uh, you know, the phone bill. Uh, phone, sorry, project four. Project four. Uh, project. What the main program ultimately needs to do is read the uh, read the command. Oops, read the command line arguments and then invoke the, uh, the the REST API. Make the HTTP requests to interact with the server. Now, uh, the, the co this code, the sample code, actually has evolved a bit over the years. One of the things that I realized is that um, the design of the, the the client side of the program will be better if. I encapsulate all of the interaction with the server in a different class. I like, it, I like that for two reasons. One, it makes uh, it clearly delineates the responsibilities of the project four, which is all about command line parsing, with interacting, which is kind of a big thing, right? As we've all seen, right? That, that's a thing, and that's its own. It should be its own responsibility, and keep that separate from all of the code and the logic for forming the URLs and putting together the HTTP requests, and then taking the HTTP response. And so what I had to do is I had to establish a contract, an interface, if you will, between the two. Um, and of course, I also like this because uh, we're able to um, test each one separately. So um, let's first look at the main program. Uh, so here is uh, here's how uh, you know, we parse things. Uh, oh, and some of you uh, asked about like how you can simplify your command line parsing and maybe not do so much indexing into the uh, into the args array. Well, here's my example. This is the pattern that I like to follow when it comes to parsing command line arguments, where you simply just iterate over the the arguments and keep track of what you've seen so far, um, and uh, you know populate the uh, the information from the command line that way. Um, this is this is what I use, and it works very well for me. So we go and we uh, you know uh, take out the information that we need from what's our parsed on the command of a pass on the command line. We do a little bit of error checking and then we move on. Casey, yes, you had a question. Um, so you were saying that uh, showing us how you like to do the command line, but uh, since the are, so can the tags be in any order on this assignment? Um, well, these are arguments, and so yeah, they the must appear in this order. Meaning that we, we'll, you know, our, if arg zero is host name, we'll see that before the port string. Okay. Is my question right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but maybe your question is like, oh, how do I deal with options? Well, um, basically what I do is, uh, you know, I'll say, hey, if if the arg equals, I mean, so like it would be something like, I check it first. So if arg equals, you know, dash print, then I would, uh, oops, and then this would be an else that, you know, an else loop, oops. Elsewhere. Then I would say something like, you know, you know, do print equals true. Of course, I need to create a variable for that. No, I don't want that. Anyway, so you end up with this thing kind of looks like, kind of looks like C code. <laughs> but anyway, that's what I would. Uh, oops, what doesn't like boolean? Yeah, boolean. That's what I meant. Yep, something like that. 
Um, oh, question from Alana. Will your grading test check for the existence of usage and error in the project 4.java file? Um, usage and error. I don't look for specific methods named like usage and error. However, um, I'm pretty sure, I mean, if there's a readme, you know I'm testing with a dash readme flag, and I'm pretty sure even for project 4, I run it with no command line arguments. So those test cases, I think those are usually like the tests 1 and 2, right? I'm pretty sure those are there on project 4 also. Did I answer your question, Alana? Okay. Cool. Looks like I did. Anyway, this is the pattern that I like to use. Um, I'm going to... Now I'll leave it there and you can see in the code if I, when I commit it, if I commit it. Okay. So anyway, but all this stuff is pretty straightforward, right? You read stuff from the command line. Hey, if you're missing stuff, we'll print the arguments. Um, uh, hey, we'll convert that string, that port string into an, an int and complain if we can't. Now things get interesting. Okay, so I parse the command line and I've gotten the information I need. I've gotten the host and the port and then optionally the word and the definition. Um, now I'm going to use that stuff to interact with this rest, uh, phone bill rest client object. So here again, this is a pattern that I like where I've separated out the responsibilities of parsing the command line, which is in project four, and then interacting with the rest API, which is in the phone bill rest client. In order to create one of these, you need to specify a host name and a port that you connect to. And these are the things, these are the variables that are passed in on the command line. And now what I do is I look at the presence or lack thereof of the word and definition that were passed on the command line. So remember here, this thing um, takes four, uh, you know, four arguments, um, the host support, the word and the definition, and word and definition are optional. So basically, I've created my new REST client, and I say, aha, if my word is null, which means I'll print all of the word definitions, I'm going to invoke a method called get all dictionary entries from the client. So I create the client up here. And this is the thing then that will go off and do the REST API call. And we'll see what that, what that looks like in a minute to then get all the dictionary entries. And uh, this thing is uh, typed, uh, th th this thing returns a map, um, which is the, you know, the, the data structure that represents the dictionary, you'll modify this to return a phone bill, right? Because that's what you, um, actually, sorry, it will, yeah, dictionary enter entries, yes. Uh, it will return all of the, uh, well, the, the phone bills in the, yeah, the, the, the sorry, it will it'll return a phone, a phone bill, including its phone calls. Um, yeah, a couple of people raised their hand. Uh, let me call on you here. Uh, Tacey, yes. Sorry, I was just still hovering over the hand button. Oh, no problem. Alex? Uh, so for the integration test for the client, do we have to run the server separately before we uh, run those tests or? The answer is yes, and we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be showing that here in a minute. Yep, you're, you're a couple of head, steps ahead of me. As we will see, once we start looking at the uh, phone bill client, uh, there are integration tests for uh, these client side classes like Project 4 and Phone Bill Client. Okay. So here's the, the logic here. Um, this is where we, uh, oh, interesting. Um, uh, so what we do here is we get all the dictionary entries. This will return the map, which is the dictionary. And then we use the pretty printer to uh, dump out the contents of the dictionary. You'll be doing the same thing. Right. You will have instead of get all dictionary entries, you'll probably have something like, you know, get phone bill for customer and send in the customer name, which is read from the command line. That will return phone bill object and then you'll send that to your pretty printer. Which is, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. We'll see how all of this works. But um, because with the REST API, let's just look at this in the uh, in the browser so we can see what's at, what the raw text of what's returned. So this is the same thing as as actually calling as as uh, making an HTTP request for slash phone bill slash calls, right? This will return all of the calls in a phone bill. You'll give it a customer parameter, but um, and so then that returns. Uh, the text version of your phone bill. And then as we'll see what the client uh, object does is it'll take that text 
turn it into a phone bill object and return it. The nice thing here is that the project floor code doesn't need to worry about all of that. It doesn't, you know, it, 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 it Actually, it doesn't. Other than the fact that you send it a host and port, it doesn't know anything about the details of invoking the REST API, of putting together the HTTP request, and uh, you know, sending it off, and then reading the response, and then doing something with it. So we encapsulate all that logic, and as you'll see, there's a bit of it. All that logic in this phone bill REST client code. Similarly, um, we uh, say, hey, listen, if you gave us a word but not a definition, then we will go fetch the definition for that word from the, uh, fr from the, from the, web, from the web server by using the client. We'll say get definition for the word. And then what that returns, let's say that price returns a, oops, price returns a string, right? Oops. So I'm jumping all over the place. Yeah, it returns a string. string. Um, finally, uh, if you give it both a word and a definition, then it calls an add dictionary entry uh, method where you give it both the word and the definition, and then uh, that will create the uh, you create the definition in the dictionary, um, and then you just print out a little uh, verification message saying that yes, I defined that word appropriately. Now, as we'll see, the methods of a phone bill client can throw some exceptions like I/O exception and parser exception. And so we'll log those appropriately. But otherwise, if we get a message, we will, and so basically if, if any of these branches are successful, we'll get a message which contains either the, you know, all of the dictionary entries or uh, sort of a status saying that, yes, this is what was defined, um, and then it prints it out. Oh, so we have some dead code right here. Oops. Oh yeah, all that stuff got moved to um, uh, the client a long time ago. Okay, and then it's got like some you know usage and error, I think is uh, and stuff like that. Okay, so that's project four. So other than the fact that there's like all this client stuff that does does magic with REST, any, any sort of questions about what you're seeing here? Hopefully the command line parsing is pretty straightforward. Yeah. So like this code right here. Well. What happens if you try to connect to a server that doesn't exist? You get some sort of I/O exception. Or hey, what happens if your uh, what, what the the data that you get, that is sent back from the uh, server is corrupt and you can't parse it? You can't turn it into a phone call or a dictionary. In this case, you get a parser exception, right? Yeah. But no, great question, right? And this is where exceptions. This is the you know, this is where like, you get experience. Um, Thinking about exceptions and working with them. I mean, Grant, all you're doing is just like printing out an error message. But yeah, part of the behavior of this client is to convey when something has gone wrong. And actually, we'll see some more examples of that shortly. Um, oh, actually, though, before we dive into that, um, you know, uh, Alex asked about uh, integration tests for this. So let's talk about that because there are integration tests for project four. Now, uh, I just want to remind you, once again, project four takes four arguments on the command line host port word definition. So now let's take a look at the project four integration tests. Okay. So we've been working with integration tests since the first day of class. And, uh, you know, what, what I had said at the time was integration tests, so unit tests are just like for a single class, or a couple classes interacting, and they're really fast and lightweight, and they, you know, uh, they, they validate the little pieces of functionality in your program. Integration tests um, are meant for larger pieces of functionality, more classes involved, more complex logic, um, and as a result, you know, they run slower, they sort of have interesting environmental things like system.error and system.out, uh, all, all that good kind of stuff. But really, the integration tests that we use uh, for projects one, two, and three, where you're invoking your main, you're using all that, eh, just sort of glorified unit tests, not very interesting. These tests, however, are much more in the spirit of what most people think of as integration tests, because what you're doing is you're testing your project four main method. In order for that to work, you need to have your web server running. So uh, right now, I have my web server running. And uh, actually, what I'll do is I'll just, I'll just shut it down here by control seeing it. And I won't restart it, but I'll run my uh, my integration tests. 
And here again, these are just plain old J unit tests. I'll run that. And it's got to rebuild my project and, uh, and sort of think about it a little bit. But I run that. And now, like everything, oh, well, lots of things fail. So, like my, uh, oh, this is interesting. So, the, uh, so project zero, uh, sorry, test zero here, which removes all of the mappings, uh, mappings should probably be all dictionary entries, um, is, uh, it, it got a connection refused exception because, well, it tried to, uh, well, it, it tried to interact with the, uh, it tried to make an HTTP request and there's nothing on the other end. Um, not surprisingly, the fact that, uh, let's just go to that. Um, here, we don't put in any command line arguments. We uh, assert that uh, the missing args string was written to standard.out. This one passes, actually, because it doesn't attempt to contact the server because you didn't tell it what host import. Okay, this one still passes. And then the rest of them, they get, uh, oh, interesting, they get an empty string. I guess I'm a little surprised by that. Oh, there you go. Okay, these are just kind of wacky things. Oh, I wonder why that didn't, um, I'm surprised it didn't like blow up. Oh, maybe you're right. So maybe because there's standard error, let's find that out. So let's see here. Let's assert that um, result.get text written to standard error uh, equal to empty string. Good call. I'll run that again. Nope. Oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, it's empty, but was while connecting, to, while connecting to server, connection exception, connection refused. Okay. So this was, interestingly enough, and actually then, okay, yeah. Oh, okay, I understand. So actually, test zero, what this is doing is invoking the uh, REST client directly to remove all the entries on the server. So it's not using the uh, the main method, actually. But the other ones do. Interesting. I should then, uh, I should assert that, and I should add that to, uh, yeah, that one. That one's okay. This one, uh, I guess I can just put that here, and then put that here, and then put that here. I should probably just say invoke main without error. <laughs> Probably put all that in a uh, class. Yep, here again. So expected uh, an empty string, and then instead it got some stuff written to standard error. So okay, this is this is good. So this is basically um, uh, this is what so so and and so then if I try to run the uh, the command line program uh, as is with like localhost 8080. Right, what I get is that error message saying, well, contact server, connection exception, connection refused. Okay, and that is probably because if we then go and look at the code for project four, well, we're probably catching some, you know, like an IO exception of some sort and then printing it out. Actually, I should probably just say get message. And then we'll rebuild, we'll say maven w package to rebuild the war file. With our, well, we build the, the jar file and the war file. It builds both. Unit tests. <laughs> there you go. So now we don't serve C evidence that there was a stack. Uh, it was an exceptional throne. Okay. Well, okay, so this, that was kind of a neat little detour to show you what happens when the server isn't running. So now we will run the server again. We'll start that up. Okay, and so now we'll run this from the command line again. No words in the dictionary because we restarted the jetty, so we lost all of our work. That's okay. Um, and now we will run our uh, our tests again. Oops, we'll go back to our integration tests, and we'll run all these again. And I think now you'll see that they pass. They do. And now let's see here. If we uh, go and look, I think there's going to be some test data in here. Yep, there's some test data. Word definition. Okay, 
right? And it's, okay, but this is kind of an interesting thing, right? I ran my tests and it left some stuff around, which may or may not be a problem. I know that in my career, I've written lots of tests that have had side effects and then like, you know, it works fine when you run it in isolation and then you run it as part of a suite and it's like, oh, things fail because you left a bunch of data lying around. So you need to, you know, you need to figure out how much effort you're going to go into to make sure that your tests are um, Clean up, for, clean, clean up after themselves and are idempotent. Um, let's look at what these tests do. So uh, this, uh, so, so uh, we use the invoke main test case, which all of your integration tests for projects one, two, and three used. Um, but notice that before the declaration of our class, we have this at test order um, annotation with method name dot class. Now, there was some detail about this in the JUnit lecture. You can go back and review it. But basically what this says is, hey, listen, uh, this, this test class contains multiple test methods, so everything annotated with at test. And when you run them, please run them alphabetically by the name of the method. Now, in this case, um, we have uh, previous, let's see here. Uh, well, do we? Yeah, it turns out I don't, but I could, I suppose. Um, uh, but we could. I, I, um, these, uh, but it runs them in their. Uh, actually, no, no. It is important to run this method first to uh, remove all mappings at the um, at the beginning uh, of, of the test. So this clears out all the data in the uh, in the dictionary. And the way it does this is it calls remove all dictionary entries, which ends up calling do delete uh, over here. Oops, uh, which calls do delete over here in the servlet, which just clears the dictionary and says, OK. And then what we'll go through is it'll execute these in order. So the first one is like, hey, just make sure that no command line arguments prints out missing args, which you know it does. And here again, these are just tests for your command line, right? So I mean, they look a lot like the, the ones that you did for projects one, two, and three. Here we want to make sure that uh, the empty uh, that, that when you run, when, when you, when you uh, sorry, print all of the, uh, I don't want that name. It should be something like, um, you know, an, an empty server contains zero, uh, uh, zero entries, or empty, server, empty dictionary contains zero entries. And so what we do is we then invoke uh, main with that host and port. Because we cleaned everything out in test zero, there isn't anything there. And so then we expect that what was written back to standard output from the uh, yeah from the uh, fr from well when you call the REST API uh, is pretty printer or contains the string pretty printer wor or format word count of zero which is well basically this string right here dictionary and server contains zero words is what it'll be when it's when it's cleaned out. Um, let's see here. Some other things. Uh, oh, interesting. This is surprising. So no definition throws an appointment book rest exception. Oh, okay. So this is actually kind of bad behavior on my part because Okay, this is just for the, I guess, the sake of demonstration. Um, but let's say uh, we go through and ask for a word that doesn't exist like foo. Uh, there's an uncaught exception. That's bad, right? You shouldn't do that. But for the case of uh, of this uh, demonstration, um, what we uh, what we validate is that okay, when you go to look up a word that doesn't exist, you get a special kind of exception called a, a rest exception, and the uh, cause of that exception is uh is that rest exception so you'll you'll catch the uncaught exception in main you'll get the cause which is a rest exception and this is something that i wrote um yep and that uh the rest exception has a, they can get the http status code because remember what happens when you try to look up a word that isn't there if we go back to a web browser and we look up a word uh which isn't there foo you get a 404 well i want to test that from uh from my code and so the way I do that, well, I go to look up a word that isn't there, uh, and then I make sure that the exception uh, uh, that that is is thrown uh, has a cause oops, has a cause or a rest exception, and then when you get its, its status code, it is indeed 404. These are the kinds of things that you can do in the integration tests. 
Uh, oh, getting some security manager deprecated errors running JD18 like a different project to. Oh, shoot. Did I not fix that? Oh, in project four? Did I not update the example? Okay, so. Um, sorry, let me. Uh, what Java version am I running here? We're in Java 18. How come I'm not seeing. Oh, because. Uh, sorry, wait a second. Okay, I'll get back to that in just a second after I'm done talking about this. And then lastly, in Project 4 IT, um, I will, uh, yep, um, what we do here, we actually add a definition to make sure you can get it. So this is sort of like the end-to-end -end test. So the first thing that we do is we um, create the, uh, we, we create the definition in the uh, in the phone in the sorry in the dictionary by putting both word and definition on the command line uh, and make sure that yes we get the the message that we expect then we go and we look it up by just having the word on the command line and uh, make sure that yep it's uh, it contains that and I use this uh, this pretty pretty enough format dictionary entry um, method to ease testing. So, uh, you know, that way I don't have like a hard code string for my pretty printer. Um, I just assert that, yes, it's the, you know, basically the method was called the way I expect. And then similarly, I go and print all of the entries and make sure again that my word and definition are are in there. But what this test does, it just, inter it just um, inter interacts with the project four main. So it's the same thing as, in try, you know, as invoking the command line. And so this gives you a good idea of what the command line is all about. So as you can see, when we were running Jetty, uh, all of those would pass. Now, if I go and I do a Maven uh, verify, you know, or clean, let's do a clean verify, whatever. Take another minute here, uh, verify. The same Maven clean verify that you use in all your other projects, but now it's going to do something else. Yeah, it'll do, it, it will compile the source code. It will run the unit tests. It'll build the web application file, the war file, and that client jar, as we talked about. And then it'll run the unit, well, actually, then it, then it wants to run the integration test. But before that, it needs to start up Jetty. It needs to start up the web application server. And it does that. So Maven will start it for you as part of running the integration test. It's doing it right now. It started up, um, started up Jetty. And then, uh, and then it ran the tests. Now it stopped Jetty. And then the verify makes sure that everything passed. And it did. Uh, oh, and it gets code coverage also. So that's another nice thing about Maven, right? Maven has built-in support for writing integration tests for web applications because there is a Jetty plugin that we've configured to, uh, to start Jetty before the integration test, run the integration tests. So that will then interact with that Jetty that's there during test. Uh, and after the test, after the tests are done, it'll shut down the, the Jetty and move on with itself. So I didn't get any problems running the integration test. So that's funny. Um, the way you fix that is you look in the palm.xml for the phone bill web, and you should see that it that it depends on projects version 20.22.2.0. So I, I I fixed that. So there was a bug in version 22 uh, 20.22.1.0 that caused that problem under JDK 18. Um, and unless you created the phone bill like during the first week of class, which or, sorry, the, the, the phone bill web application during the first week of class, it should be okay. So I'm kind of surprised then. Okay, so Nicholas. Okay, okay, good. Well, hey, thanks for pointing that out. So yeah, it should be okay if you just um, if you just change that. And what will you get? Well, uh, yeah, let's, yeah. Let, let me know how that works. That should it should just require that. So if you um, if you just created it last week, okay, and, and it's using version twenty twenty two dot two dot zero. Just double check. Oh, interesting. And when did you? Okay. So. Huh. Okay, because oh. I know why. Right, we never went through that. Ugh. Okay. So, um. Oh, interesting. Did I? Yeah, I bet those have, have this here. Okay. 
Um, I don't. Okay, so it's so, okay. Um, long story short, uh, I'll point out to you the directions on how to do so in the um, in the Getting Started repository, which is also the same as the README for all your repositories. So what I, I found this bug um, during the first week of class. Boy, I thought I had all that fixed. Actually, it was before the term started, but anyway. Found this bug, thought I fixed it. Um, and I fixed it, I think it's the prerequisites. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Um, so the prerequisites class, or the prerequisites script here should reference version 22.2.0 of the archetypes. And I wonder if this particular change isn't in your repository. So like, it might have been that the getting, that, that, you know, some people created their summer 2022 repositories before I had this change. You can get this change into your, uh, oh, you, you, you did Alex, right? Yeah, okay, right, yeah, yeah, you're the one, I think you were the one that found it. So, um, oops. Oh, no, I want upstream. Here we go. Awesome. Uh, right. Okay. So, um, oh, uh, Jacob, would it be advisable to destroy the current repo and just reclone? No, I, I wouldn't think so. Cause they don't blow away all your, uh, right. Uh, blow away all your work. So no, it's probably not better to reclone. You should probably just update the dependency, which is essentially what you'll get. And you can read this, how can I get changes that people make into my clone section. This basically shows you how to make what's called an upstream remote repository um, for your repository. And then you can pull my latest changes. Cause remember your repository started with all of my changes. Uh, it's, equivalent to a branch. I've gone and made a couple more changes in my getting started that aren't in your, oops, that aren't in your repositories. And so what you can do is you can um, merge them into, uh, by doing a pull upstream main, it'll merge the, uh, the changes from my, uh, from my repository, the plain old getting started repository into, into your repository. Gosh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, bugs. Okay, so um, that's the deal with uh, the command line program and with uh, integration tests. So uh, again, the integration tests require that Jetty run, and when you do a Maven clean verify, Maven takes care of starting Jetty, deploying the web application to it, and then running the integration tests against it, so they interact. Yeah. Oh, the question is, hey, why not have the integration test start Jetty itself? Uh, it's probably technically feasible. I wouldn't advise it, right? I mean, how does one start Jetty? Can I call a command line? Yeah, so, it's, it's, so in this case, it's better to have the Maven scaffolding, this, uh, scaffold run the, it, it'll take a because that will take care of both starting up Jetty and deploying the web application and running your unit tests, uh, running your integration tests. Let the integration tests sort of assume that stuff is, is, is running, that the environment is already there, because either Jetty will take care of it if you're running it from, sorry, Maven will take care of it if you're running from Maven, or you can just you know use the command line over here to start Jetty, and then run your, uh, run your integration tests. So, yep. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, and, and actually, so for this integration test, for, for Jetty, when you're integrating with Jetty, yes, you know, having the, it's easier to do it that way. There may be other, yeah, when you're writing integration tests for maybe something that can be uh, integrated or can be embedded into the test a little bit more easily. So let's say, yeah, you do have like, oh, I don't know, like a little lightweight server that you run in a separate thread or something like that, or you don't have a Maven plugin to do it for you. Oops, something blew up. Oh yeah, because I got the JUnit vintage. I need to do a clean. 
right? Is the problem that happens when you run code coverage because IntelliJ gets confused. So as you can see, there's more stuff to do, and then, so things take a little longer to run. And this is why I wanted to emphasize using Mockito to develop servlet because you'll be able to do faster iteration on your unit test to get your servlet all running. And uh, get your servlet all running. Yeah, have your servlet serve do what you expect, and then you can uh, start interacting with the servlet uh, via um, integration tests, and then work on the client side logic of your code. So uh, once more, I will run this, and hopefully it'll be better now. Wait, seriously? Oh, no, I think I need to re rerun the entire build. Oh, so it's begun. So why, why didn't it? That's weird. What didn't it like? I did it clean, didn't I? Huh. Do a clean. I'll get to that question in a chat in the chat in a moment. I will rerun this. Oh, I wonder if I have to build a project from scratch. Okay, so now that is unhappy. Now if I run Jetty. Yeah, I don't know exactly why this happens. Now Jetty's running. Now I run my code again. Okay, I'm happier now. Question. So how do we store our phone bills? We need to save them to the hard drive. So we just hard code the file location, rewrite them there. No, no, you don't. You don't persist the phone uh, bills. Um, you persist. You, you store them in memory in the server. You don't need to write them to disk. Because um, the way I'll test it is that I will start the uh, the jetty once, then I'll run all the test cases, and then I'll stop the jetty. So yeah, no, no, no. You've already demonstrated to me that you can uh, write, you know, write files. Um, you'll do it again in the Android project, but you know, hey, take the week off. So uh, it'll be back. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dave. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see here. I'm getting an error when I try to run all the tests in the test suite. No tests found, and blah. Anyone else get this or any ideas how to fix it? Um, oh, okay, uh, so so Alex says he's seen that before and that what he's done is what he said, clean it from IntelliJ. Okay, so then do under uh, build, uh, somewhere, zoom windows, uh, build, build, rebuild project or build project. Um, run Maven clean, then rebuild IntelliJ, and then you've seen it go away. Okay, I'll just give that a try. Alex to Alex. Okay. Here we go. Cool. Okay. So, um, that's integration tests, or that's the integration test for the main. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, these are constants. I, I, sorry, I didn't hear the last part. These are defined, yep, at the top of the file here. Um, it's, uh, yeah, host name is always localhost, and then, uh, this is actually the, the port can be specified by a system property in case you're working on a machine where you can't use port 8080. Like if you're working on one of the shared CS machines and someone else is hogging that port. That's not something you're gonna have to worry about. Nope. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, 10 minutes, uh, 11 minutes. I'll be back at 6.40, and uh, then we'll dive into what that, uh, that client is all about, that phone bill client. Okay, we're back. So, during, uh, the, so far in class, we have looked at the client side of Project 4, and we looked at the uh, Project 4 class, which is the main method, does the command line parsing, and then we saw how that class can be integrated, it can be tested via integration tests, and uh, how important it is, or how no noticeable it is, that here we need to have the Jetty server running while it integrates with it. 
So that was that was all neat. Now let's look at uh, now let's look at the phone bill REST client. So recall from Project Four what the REST client does is it is the thing that actually makes the calls off to the REST API that invokes the uh, that, that that will send HTTP requests to the servlet um, by uh, well, by creating HTTP requests. Um, and then getting their responses and doing things with them. And the functionality that it implements are things like, hey, give me all the dictionary entries, or hey, go get me the definition for a given word. Now, the, uh, these APIs, or I guess the last one is you know, add dictionary entry. These are the, this is the functionality of your program, right? And the client represents this functionality as Java methods that take in parameters of a certain type and return um, objects of a certain type. So for instance, uh, and they're pretty simple because it's a pretty simple application, right? Get, get definition takes a, a word and returns a string, which is the definition there. But you can imagine that in your program, you'd want something like a uh, search, um, search phone bill, and it would take the start date and the end date. Oh, great question. Can you describe the difference between the phone bill rest client and the phone bill servlet, yes, and because there are there is a big difference. One is, and I'll go back to the picture, one's on the client side, one's on the server side. So the ser and, and basically what the client does is it makes, it creates the HTTP requests and sends them to the client. So conceptually, um, what, what, you know, the client side API, the, the client side yeah, the, the client side API, the, the, the Java code, has the same concepts as, uh, as the rest of the application, right? Give me a definition for a word. And uh, the same thing then over here on the servlet, do get, I suppose in many ways, is give me a definition of a word. However, um, it's, uh, it, they're running different processes and they implement that functionality in very different ways. Right, what the client does is it's the thing that will put together the, um, the, 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 the URL, and by the way, the URL, and then we'll fetch that URL, uh, the URL is simply uh, phone calls. I don't, we, don't have, we don't have any phone um, calls in here, so we'll just add one. Uh, let's put in foo as bar, right, make sure it's there, yep. And so then uh, word equals foo. So what, the, so what we'll see here is that the uh the get definition method here the implementation of it will basically form this url right here localhost ad ad slash phone bill slash calls question mark word equals foo it will send it to the server and it will get back and, and then it will take the response from the server just like the um uh, just like the uh, web browser does here and it will then do something with it but what what the phone bill REST client does is it abstracts all of that so that your Project 4 class has a very easy to use and familiar and fluent API to work with. This is a big part of the lesson. So if you're kind of like, oh, this is kind of a weird way to do it. True. This is some, you know, this is sort of like meta lesson and object oriented programming and having a service that then a service object that hides all this implementation. Um, another way to do it, which is sort of like the CS101 way of doing it, was sure, put all of the HTTP calls here in your main method. Because we're, no, we're not. We're beyond that now, right? We want to have code that is easy to structure and easy to test. And the thing I like about this is that, as we'll see, we are able to write tests against the client. We don't need to worry about parsing the command line. We can just call these methods from a test, and they'll do the thing that we expect. Alana, any other questions? Because that was, that was a big, important question that you asked. I'm glad you did. Any other uh, uh, follow-up questions or anything you'd like to explore there? Yeah. Um, so one question I had was, um, we are pretty printing the uh, phone call or the phone bills to the web application, right? Um, no. Actually, the data that's returned from the uh, from the servlet is the text format. So okay. you'll be using text dumper. Um, the pretty printing happens only on the client. Okay. So when we load the web page with like a search in it, mm -hmm. what should that web page actually look like? 
Well, uh, it will return. It'll contain the text of the phone bill uh, that has the phone calls that match the search. So would we um, use the text dumper to do that then? You absolutely would. Yep. Okay. There it is. Yeah. Right. And so the data exchange format between the client and the server is the text format, which again, is kind of a lesson here, right? Uh, conceptually, it's the same thing as using the file as the, uh, oh, sorry, using that, that the text format as a data exchange format between the, the file and the program. But now you're basically writing it off to the uh, to the server um, instead of the file. Yeah. So at what point do we use Pretty Printer? On the client side, on the only I recommend they use it only in Project Four class. So we use it right here. So like get dictionary entries. Um, this would probably you would probably change this to be something like uh, you know get phone bill. It would take an argument of the customer name and it would return a phone bill object that you would then dump to the pretty printer. Okay, there it is. Yes, yes. Correct. Yeah, and, and I know it's not obvious here. Um, uh, actually, it's super subtle. Let, let's take let's take a look. So um, let's. Uh, okay. So if we just have the calls endpoint, it returns foo colon bar. If we uh, if we just have if we ask for all of the. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's just another one. Bat baz. And so now we've got two entries here. And so it's word, colon, word, word, colon, word. That is the text format. Um, the, uh, the pretty format has this header right here. And so you know what? I should change this. I should change the pretty to make it visually distinct. Uh, I should say I should have an arrow here instead. Ooh, fancy. Right, so now if I do that and I recompile the client side, I say maybe package. Uh, question was what, under what circumstances exactly is the pretty stuff invoked? Is it is it, it's definitely search. It is definitely I guess only search. Yep. Oh no, actually sorry, you can pre print all phone calls in a phone bill. So I guess when you just have the name of the customer, too. You are welcome. Okay, now it's pretty. It's got this little header saying dictionary uh, server contains two words and it's got arrows. Yep. Yep. So this is the text format. This is the pretty format. Yep. Cool. I should make a note of these things. Okay. Uh, Oh, uh, question. What dependency would you use for templating in HTML if we wanted to play with some? Oh, gosh, web frameworks. Um, yeah. um, oh, I don't know. I mean, these days, if you're going to write a web application, you want to have you know lots of JavaScript. You want to use um, React or you know, all, all these different things there. Um, honestly, these, you know, these days, I suppose the choice of framework does matter. I'm much more concerned about do we understand what the application needs to do, and then that, those are the hard questions, and then figuring out how to implement it. That's just a matter of coding. So sorry, it's not a very satisfying answer. Um, but of course, then you got to figure out what your data exchange format is, and so do you talk over REST? Do you talk over GraphQL? Oh my gosh, holy wars! Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, we and uh, actually there's something important I wanted to call out what, from what I just did. So what we just did is we changed the pretty printer to behave differently. Now, when you're developing your project for there's something important that you need to pay attention to, which is the fact that you can change your code. Um, and if you want those changes to take effect in Jetty, you need to restart Jetty. 
So, right, I changed my code on the client side. I rebuilt the client jar, and I was able to run it, and we saw the change, and that was fine because it only runs on the client. If we change something on the server, like the servlet or your text dumper or any other code that's used on the server, then in order to see that cha change take effect, you'll need to restart your Jetty, and that will rebuild everything, redeploy the web application, and then you'll have the new functionality there. That's why probably the, the fastest approach to doing this project, although it might not be the most intuitive or natural, um, is to test is to write unit tests for your servlet, sort of get your servlet working um, with the unit tests, then start doing the more expensive integration tests of uh, working with the servlet. But hopefully, you won't need to change it as much. Do you have a question or just like staring intently? It's like, oh, I guess okay, cool. Um, okay, so now let's take a look at the phone bill REST client. Actually, let's just make it big here. Okay, so again, the phone bill REST client, what this thing does is it provides a, a Java API on top of all the HTTP calls that, that you make. And the secret sauce here is that it uses this class called HTTP Request Helper, which is something that I wrote um, to actually do the heavy lifting of making the uh, making the HTTP well, first of all, assembling um, the HTTP uh, HTTP requests, sending them off to the server, and getting the the response back. So uh, we. Um, Let's see here. So when you create your HTTP REST client, you give it a, a host name and a port. Um, and then this will configure the HTTP REST request helper um, to basically, well, hit URLs with, um, hit the right URLs with the slash phone bill slash classes. That's what this stuff does here. Um, uh, I've recently introduced uh, this other constructor, which is visible for testing, where you can uh, inject, where you can provide your own HTTP request helper um, instance, and I think you can use a mock object to uh, to test that. Actually, do I have an example of that? I do. Oh yeah, here's where I use a mock one. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so the key to understanding this class is really to understand the HTTP request helper class and what it does. So HTTP request helper is yet another helper object um, that uh, gives you methods like make a get request. And what you get, what you give it is the map of key value pairs that are put on the URL, right? HTTP uh, request helper is all about assembling the URL and making the request off to of the server and then returning this response object, which then you can interrogate to get information about the response of the, uh, to the HTTP request. So what is the get all dictionary entries? Well, basically you are you're performing this URL. You are doing a get of slash phone bill slash calls which is like the default URL here, we, we assemble it here. So there are no additional arguments to it, meaning there is no like question mark, you know, word equals, you know, foo or whatever, right? We don't have that on this one. That's just no, uh, no arguments there. And so what we do is we just send an empty map to the get method. So we'll do that. And if that's successful, it'll return a response object. And the response object has um, various uh, methods. You can do things like get the content that was returned from the uh, HTTP request, which will be whatever the um, whatever the servlet wrote to the print writer. You can also uh, you can get the number of lines. That should really be number of lines. Um, and you can get oops, you can get the HTTP status code. You can get all sorts of uh, interesting things about the uh, about the response. Go read the API to figure it out. So what this will return is the uh, is the text format of the dictionary. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and as a string, so that's the whole thing is a string, right? And then I'm going to create a string read around that and send it to my text parser. And I'm just going to say text parser .parse. And so right now what, what I'm doing is I'm leveraging my text parser to do the heavy lifting of pulling apart the response that I got from the, uh, from the server. And then that returns my domain object, which is my dictionary, my map of strings to strings. So uh, this is a you know a pretty simple little implementation that here's where the, you know, the here's the unique stuff it goes off and calls 
the it does a get of uh, of that URL, it gets the response, but then it just lets you know text parser do all the heavy lifting to then get you the the map of dictionaries. And this is another one of those like single responsibility theorem things where we use lots of objects to help us out, and because we already had a text parser, um, and you've got one too. Right, because we had a text parser, um, we can reuse that functionality even though that text originated not from a file, but it originated from an HTTP uh, request. We don't care, or rather, text parser doesn't care. All it knows is it's got a reader that contains some text. Get definition. What it does is will it will uh, it will create this URL that I've got here. So it takes uh, it starts off with slash phone bill slash calls, and it appends to it. Um, the uh, the parameters word equals foo, and so when you run this, then okay, it returns a text representation of that one uh, that one dic def uh, dictionary definition. And so here it um, uh, it returns a single string. So how does it do that? Well, now it uses that HTTP request helper again. It calls the get method, but now it sends it a map with one key value uh, pair, which is word equals word, which represents and word is the thing that's passed in. So that's this stuff right here, word equals word. So word equals foo. It goes off and makes that HTTP request. It'll return again, foo colon bar. Um, oh. It does a check here, and actually this should do a check there also. Um, I'll, I'll dive into that in a second. It goes and gets the content. It once again it sends it to the text parser, it, right? It parses the text again. But now instead of returning the entire map, it only we only want to return the value of that word, and so then we will uh, then we will do the parser dot parse, which returns the map of entries. This is akin to your phone bill. And it calls gets with the uh, with the word that was passed in. This is a, an important method right here. So actually, we were just talking about it um, during break, uh, and you know, and the question was, uh, well, geez, you know, if I do something that if something goes wrong in the middle of my method, how do I know whether I should catch an exception and, uh, and, and deal with it? Maybe throw a different exception uh, with, with the root cause. Should I just propagate it to the caller? What should I do? In this case, it's not just throwing an exception. It's like, hey, if I get, uh, if, if my HTTP status code is not 200, if it's not cool, if it's not okay, what do I do? Well, because the phone bill REST client is all about providing a fluent, uh, Java API over these REST calls, uh, over these HTTP requests, what we want to do is we want to throw an exception when something goes wrong. So we call this, we, we check uh, with this throw exception if not okay HTTP status method. Um, and sorry, before I do that, I want to, uh, I really should, actually every time I, uh, yeah, actually every time I make one of these calls, I should also call throw exception if not okay HTTP status, uh, which I think I do every place else, but I forgot that one. So what that method does is the following. It uh, gets, it takes the response and says, hey, what's your HTTP code? If it's not okay, then I get the content and I send the code and the content to, uh, to this REST exception uh, constructor. And this is something, this is, uh, this is my code um, that just, yep, carries those as a payload. But what this does is this then conveys to the client that, hey, something went wrong while invoking this REST API, while making this HTTP request, hey, you know, I asked for a word that doesn't exist, for instance, and I get a 404 back. And this then conveys that a 404 is not expected. Otherwise, what are you gonna do, right? Uh, if, you're, if you go and you, um, you know, if you look for, the definition of a word doesn't exist, and the service that you call returns a 404, how do you handle it? Well, because it's a Java code, you're going to uh, throw an exception because it's an exceptional case. And this all becomes part of your interface, all part of the contract that this provides. And so then we'll see in the, uh, in the, in, in the automated tests, in the integration tests for the client class, we're able to catch that exception and verify that we get the right thing.
add dictionary entry takes a word and its definition. And now we want to do an HTTP post. And so what we do is we then use the post method that, uh, with the word and the definition. Um, and then HTTP post is a method that I wrote, so you don't have to, which will go and encode everything correctly so that it, um, uh, so that, it, that the parameters appear on the right place. And so then uh, when your do post method is called on your, on your servlet, then uh, the parameters will be available as expected. I'm sorry, what was I can hear you? Correct. You're not building the yeah. You're you're not building either the the big old URL for get or you're not putting the um, key value pairs in the body of the request like you do for a post. I'm taking care of that for you. Ah. So okay, you know. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that's not too much abstraction for you. But um, you know, in the distant past when I didn't do that, it took even longer for people to figure it out. And so anyway, so this this is some of the magic that I'll that I'll hide from you. Of course, you can go look at the implementation and uh you know see it uses all sorts of you know java uh, net apis like hp url connection and it'll set the request method and do all the right stuff with the output stream reader i you know right you know uh i'll i'll do this for you so you can focus on more interesting things in your applications because you only got a couple of weeks to do it and finally for testing purposes uh, i should probably just have that visible for testing um uh, remove all dictionary entries, which simply does a HTTP delete, which is called do delete over there. And so then what you need to do is you need to augment this fluent, you know, this Java object that represents your REST service that will then make all the calls to pass in the right information, have it return things like your phone bill. Um, hey, maybe uh, the add dictionary entry. So this would be something like add phone call, just take a phone call object. Instead, I figure out how to model it, right? Figure out uh, how uh, to make it work in a way that makes sense to you. So here you have the, the REST client, and now let's take a look at the REST client integration test. Oh, I guess there's also a unit test for it. Oh, okay, neat. Okay, I wrote a unit test for it. Um, oh, huh, this is kind of nice. Okay, so... Uh, this is, let me get rid of this stuff here so we can see the whole thing. Okay. Oh, yeah, this is a simple uh, unit test for your, your phone bill. And what we do is we mock out the HTTP uh, helper. So we're basically mocking out the, uh, the whole process of uh, creating an HTTP uh, request, executing it, and returning the results. And actually, this is kind of nice because now you can write a unit test for your phone bill REST client. Um, which might be faster than, uh, actually probably definitely will be faster than trying to develop it as a full integration test. And so what do you do? Uh, you have like some data, so let's see here, get uh, all dictionary entries for form HTTP get with no parameters, right? This is basically saying that, hey, when I call, uh, oh, sorry, uh, okay, right. So when I um, call get all dictionary entries, what I'm going to get is the, the dictionary that I expect. And so then what I do is I mock out the behavior of my HTTP request helper by saying, hey, listen, when the get method is invoked with, and here again, go read up on Mockito if you really want to get into this stuff, and you should, it's super awesome. When, uh, when the get method is invoked with an empty um, map, then return, yep, all of the dictionary entries. Um, and so then this is basically, you know, uh, and, and, and which is, essentially what your servlet does. Um, but now you're just mocking out that behavior here in object. And because you've mocked it out, you can write a unit test for your client um, without having to have the server running. Question. Do you give an example of getting a phone bill using the REST client? All the available methods work with map, so I'm not sure how. Um, uh, I can, but it, that's, that's, that's the assignment, first of all. Um, and also, uh, that's not a quick thing for me to do. I want to make sure there's enough time for, um, pair uh, for, for mob programming. Um, uh, 
However, in the winter, when I taught the 11 week course, we did have time to do that. So if you want to go see if you can find, I don't know, probably like week five or six from the winter, it's on YouTube uh, and it won't be a phone bill. It'll be, I don't know, a, appointment book or something. I can't remember what I used there, but it'll be similar. So basically what, what I mean, what, but you know, I think you're, what you're getting at is the, uh, is the guts of the assignment is to figure out, okay, how do I take this dictionary and refactor and morph it into my phone bill and have it all work? Yeah. Good question. It's like, hey, can I still use my own, you know, personal handcrafted uh, text format? Yes, you can. I am not going to, uh, because the text files have their own format, I didn't specify what the, what the format was, um, I will not use, you know, I'll only use your client with your server. They will talk, you know, the expectation is that they will speak in the same format. Yep. Well, yeah, right, there's a text format for the dictionary application, but you're writing your phone bill application. So, yeah, the intent is that you use the same text parser and text dumper um, and the same pretty printer, right? Because what you're going to, because you, don't worry, you'll have plenty of code to write. Don't worry. Don't worry. You'll be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can write a if you're uh, if you're like all in on Mockito, here's how you can write um, uh, a unit test for the phone bill uh, REST client. Um, this will go nice and fast if you can uh, get it working. Um, but what's uh, also interesting is the phone bill REST client integration test. Um, this looks a lot like the uh, integration test for for project one, or sorry, for project one, for project four, the main class. Um, in that, hey, you've got the host name and the port. Um, and actually, I could, no, no, no. but here, what you do is you use that host name and the port to create a, a phone bill REST client. And um, so now we're basically just testing that phone bill REST client APIs. So um, as a matter of fact, these might be the same test cases. Oh yeah, uh, I guess I got rid of test three, but they are the same, they, they have the same names and that's on purpose because they're testing the same functionality, but here they're testing it through the client um, object instead of the, of the, of the main um, method. So uh, here, when we remove all the dictionaries, we create the client, and then we call remove all dictionary entries. And then this one will go through and do the HTTP delete, which again, will then go through the HTTP connection and go to your servlet and call the delete method. Right, this is the thing. This is this is why this is like such a mind blowing project. It's so much bigger in scale. You've got two, uh, not only do you have two processes, but like within the process, you have all these different objects interacting. And um, this is the way the world works. This is what object-oriented programming is all about, right? It's about encapsulating your code. It's about having uh, certain you know, uh, types with certain behaviors and all this good stuff. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit more complex. And yeah, you'll have to refactor it. Um, but this is all part of the lesson too, that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to have your HTTP code in the same class as your command line parsing. Um, uh, you, you know, the, in, in the real world, you have multiple processes talking to each other, so you've got to figure out how to do this. And you want to have the right abstractions all over the place. So um, yay learning. Hopefully you're getting your money's worth. Um, and so now, when we uh, want to say that the empty, that the, an empty server contains no dictionary entries, we're working with the Fluent REST client API. And so what do we do? We say get all the dictionary entries and we'll return a map. And we assert that the map has a size of zero. Um, here, the, uh, you know, so the whole idea is, is that we're, again, just using you know, plain old Java objects. We're in, the, re we're in the, uh, the, the other integration test for the main program, we had to test the, inputs and outputs of the main, which are sending in command line arguments and then looking at standard error and standard output. And so here's how the other ones work. We wanted to find one word, we create the client, we, um, uh, we, we put in a word and a definition, we will uh, create that 
And now when we get that definition, we expect that, sorry, we get the, we get the definition for the word, we expect it to be the test definition. And all of this is interacting with the servlet, because again, if the servlet isn't running, all of these will fail spectacularly because the server isn't running, all right? They all fail. This is kind of interesting. Oh, I expect it because we'll get to that one in a second. But now when it does run, so we'll start the uh, server again. We'll start the web server again. Nice. They all run. The last one that uh, we wanted to to show is that uh, if you have an empty word, it'll throw uh, an ex a particular kind of exception. Oh, actually, it'll throw a rest exception um, with a particular error code. So here, uh, if the if you pass in an empty string to add dictionary entry, um, we'll use the assert throws, which we've seen before. So we'll say that hey, when you when you call this API, um, it will it will result in a rest exception. And that rest exception has the HTTP status code of precondition failed, which is, I don't know, 412 or something. What is that? 412. And that the message uh, included in the error is the message that we expect. Um, and here again, th th this allows you to test this aspect of your fluent Java REST client um, in that when I go and I get an error back from the server, what is conveyed back to me as a caller of that Java method of that add dictionary entry method is an exception, a rest exception that I can then interrogate to say, oh yeah, right, it is, you know, I do get a 412 when it's empty and I get the error message that I expect. Wacky stuff, a lot more complex than uh, than what you've seen before. Welcome to the second half of advanced programming with Java. Right. So, any, any questions on that? Yeah. Oh, this thing right here? Okay, very oh, good question. This is HTTP URL connection is a standard Java class in the java.net package. And this is a field on there, which represents error code 412. And this corresponds to code over here. Nope, sorry. Uh, do I throw that over here? Um, sorry, precondition failed. Precondition, oh yeah, there it is. Missing required parameter. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is on a on the HTTP post. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention here. So HTTP post. Uh, if you go and get the parameter, and the parameter is empty, so get parameter goes and get the parameter. In this case, over here in the test, I'm passing in the empty string, and so if it equals, well, this is the empty string, and this returns null. So if the word is null, then I'm going to call this missing required parameter. Remember, this is on the servlet side. So on the server, what it does is it gets the HTTP servlet response. It, it first of all prints this missing required parameter um, message, and it sends it gets that message, and then it sends it back in the error. This is the response sent back from the server with the HTTP code of 412. Uh, with that message. And what we're asserting over here in the test is that yes, when we send in an empty string, we get error 412 and that the message that is conveyed back with that exception that came from the server is the missing required parameter, which is exactly this thing over here. Right, but, but I mean, think about what you can do, right? I mean, you can assert that when you know with all this plumbing that happens from going from the you know the request they're actually going from the 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 rest client over here and and using that rest client and you send it in an empty string and then it goes all the way to the server and does some stuff with the server and then comes all the way back and you can test all this and you can assert all of this i find it to be very powerful um and the, the reason i think it's powerful is because it gives you confidence that your code is doing what it's expecting to do which is so important to software engineering right every bug is caused by by the fact that people, someone thought it worked one way and it worked a different way. Oops, and bugs are bad. No one likes using software that bugs in it. By all my right is the servlet. Oh yeah, my 
faces in the way. Yep, it's the phone bill servlet over here on the uh, on the right. All right, and so this is what you do in Project 4. You have these two Java programs that are talking to each other, and you've got this servlet uh, that is serving up the requests, and then you have client code. You have this phone bill REST client, which wraps all of the HTTP uh, calls. You have your Project 4, which parts of the command line interacts with that uh, phone bill client. And, and so then, you know, your, your job, your task, is to understand enough about this code so you can evolve it to work with uh, phone bills and phone calls. No, it's a lot, but any questions? No. Okay. Let's take uh, another break. Um, let's take, let's take 13 minutes, come back at 7.30. We're going to learn about mob programming. Um, and we're going to do some mob programming. So uh, please stay around for that. I think it'll be a good time. Nice. Okay. So uh, at the beginning of the class, we learned uh, we we, learned, we explored more about Project Four. Um, we got to see the client side. Talked about Project Four main. Talked about the Rust uh, client. Uh, so I had to test all that stuff. A uh, good deal, and so then uh, hopefully that gives you the background that you need to pursue uh, Project 4 um, over the next week. For this class tonight, we'd like to uh, I'd like to talk about mob programming. So, um, you know, mob programming is uh, perhaps the natural evolution of pair programming, where instead of, hey, putting two people in front of the, the computer, why not have the entire team? All the people, all the brilliance, all the, you know that you have to bring to bear, put them together, and to get you know as many ideas to build resilient teams so that everybody has seen the code, so you don't have one person or even two people who are expert in an area, um, and let the conversation be free flowing. You know, this isn't a tutorial where you're watching someone code. No, you're in there with them. You're talking. You're doing the driving. You're doing well. You have the the driver, and then you have lots of navigators, lots of people who are talking about potential options. Um, and so then this is a, a different way to uh, approach software uh, development, collaborative software development, and one that I'd like you to experience. So um, we're going to start out by watching uh, a video about mob programming. Don't worry, it's not nearly as cheesy as the, um, uh, as the one that we saw about pair programming. I'm going to try to optimize the screen share for a video clip to see if that makes it any better for people who are seeing it. And let's see here, we'll go here and we will maximize this. Cool. So I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll tee it off here. So what this video shows, this is a time-lapse uh, recording of people doing mob, par uh, of people doing mob programming. Um, and this is one of the, the earliest like official mobs um, from Hunter Industries. Uh, and uh, so the, the guy over on the right here, that's Woody Zool, who um, is sort of credited as the originator and certainly the person that first evangelized uh, this. And then there's Chris Lucian, who has a really awesome podcast um, about not only just mob programming, but I mean, as it's gone on, it's explored all sorts of great um, uh, topics in software development, how to get a good team going, and then there's other people here. And Anyway, um, and so then I'm, it's a, it's a three-minute video that shows the time lapse of an entire day, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll narrate it. There is no sound to it. So the whole idea is that the you know the, the entire team works together, and uh, this actually increases productivity a, a tremendous amount um, a, a, for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, all you're doing all day is programming. You're not having meetings. You're not you know doing that. There is just a continuous flow of uh, discussion between the people doing the work, and it focuses on demonstrating functionality and implementing that functionality. And much like in uh, in pair programming, there's this notion of the driver and the navigator. And so the driver is the person that has it on the, the keyboard, but in mob programming, there's lots of navigators. 
uh, there's people that you know uh, <laughs> that that, uh, that, you know, that 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 guide uh, guide the way. Also, the product owner comes in. So the product owner is the the, the person who um, really accepts the work and says, okay, yep, something is you know been done. So guess what? Here it is. It's not even noon yet. They've already implemented and demonstrated um, uh, you know one story, one new feature uh, in the in the code. And then over on the right, what Woody's doing is uh, he's not. Uh, contributing to the work directly, but he's coaching. So he's uh, helping people um, uh, get unblocked. He is making recommendations for the uh, for how the team can work more efficiently. And you can see, you know, they're, they're going back and forth, right? Someone else had to go up to an expense report or whatever, and that's okay because the work continues and the mob continues to uh, uh, collaborate. So here it is lunch and everybody takes a break, right? Everybody takes a break together. So, yep, this guy is, I don't know, I'm checking out Reddit or doing some research or, or, or whatever while he's eating his lunch at his desk. So mildly sad lunch. Um, but, uh, and then afterwards, he will come back uh, after consuming lots of Thai food or whatever it is that software engineers eat. Um, and they dive right back into it. Uh, you can't see it here, but they've got two projectors. So they basically have that, you know, lots of code to look at. It's a very visceral experience, mob programming, um, because you're all doing it and you're doing it together as a team. Uh, everybody contributed. Everybody's engaged when they want to be engaged. If you need to tap out, you can tap out um, because your hands are on the keyboard the entire time and you're not navigating the entire time either. And so this allows you to just naturally um, uh, engage and disengage as you feel like it. So you don't get uh, you don't get tired. You don't um, you know uh, get get exhausted uh, because you're allowed because you're able to just go in and out uh, throughout the day. So here they are, they're working, they're getting stuff done, they're taking turns. So again, this isn't like performance art, this is everybody um, uh, collaborating to get the job done. So yes, all the brilliant people working on the same problem at the same time. On the same computer. This is the this is the mantra of mob programming, uh, which is saying, "Hey, get everybody uh, working together. Let them uh, let them collaborate. You'll end up with software that works, gets developed quickly, um, and a team that is engaged and resilient as more people come and go." So that is an introduction to mob programming. What are your thoughts? What are your observations about what you just saw? Any initial reactions? Yeah. Oh, right. So there's this person who was like off in, in the back, sort of came and went. Um, that person had like an expense report to do. And so then, uh, well, actually, there, was, there, was, there were two people. It was the product owner who came in, and the product owner is the person that ultimately like accepts the accepts the work and says, "Great, you implemented that feature. That's really good. Hey, what about that? What about that? Oh, okay, great. Make these tweaks. You know, I'll be back in an hour." That kind of that kind of interaction. But there's also someone who needed to tap out, who like had an, I think it was an expense report to do. But hey, maybe you know on a given day someone's you know got to go to a dentist appointment, or hey, someone yep has got to meet with a client or or whatever. Um, you know that's that is the reality of, of of software engineers. But when you've got that mob, here again you've got lots of eyes on the problem. You've got a resilient team that knows about you know all the all the codes for written. Good observation, right? You can imagine it would be slow or frustrating if it's like, oh, we all know what needs to be done. Let's just go and do it. Um, I can see from experience and perhaps doing these projects, you've had the same experience that you don't always know what to do. And, um, and you know, there's also this thing that, uh, that Chris Lucian has said in his podcast is that anything that you that is so certain that you know how to do it, you should automate that. Like for instance, you've got like you know, creating a uh, uh, let's say you've got like your know, boilerplate code to model objects in a database or something like that. That should be automated. It's better to invest time to figure out how to do that automatically at a press of a button than it is to like oh blindly work on my own because very it's very easy to go from like I know what I'm doing on my own to like 
oh, well, I took this guest to my own. I was like, I really don't know what I do on my own, but I work on my own. So who do I ask? Right. right. So, you know, I think the, the, the mob program mentality says, great, if there's something that everybody knows how to do, work together to make that super easy. Right. Command line parsing, for instance. Right. You know, so if everybody knows how to parse the command line, then it's like, great, how do we make it, you know, how do we then write a framework for command line parsing so that's like a five-minute task the next time that we need to do it. Folks who are remote from the classroom, uh, any thoughts or uh, initial reactions, observations to mob programming? I have a question regarding like the productivity of uh, like this kind of yeah. activity. So I can see if like uh, they've got like a job done or a feature like done, five people working on the same time. Um, I believe if they were working separately, they would have achieved at least like three or four times what they have done like right now. All, uh, all experienced practitioners in mob programming, uh, well, virtually all experienced experience practitioners in mob programming would disagree. What they've found is that by having instant access to people, by switching off the work, but and having everybody focused on the same thing, they actually get things done a lot faster because they're not blocked, because they don't get tired as an individual. And you have the extra advantage of the resiliency of the team. So even if individually you aren't or certainly don't or don't feel that you're productive or even aren't as productive as a team you are I, again from experience and anybody who's like worked on teams especially student teams knows there's always a couple of people that don't pull their weight well here it's really obvious that there's someone who's pulling their weight um and uh everybody you know is part of the solution so then when you need to continue on you don't have the ramp up costs like trying to figure out what was in someone's head six months or six years ago nope you were there you were in the room you saw it happen, and you're much more likely then to be able to continue to c collaborate to it. So that's what you know the the experience shows, and this is why I want you to experience it for yourself to see what it's like. Um, and on a uh, on a non-trivial problem, so it won't be like you know that first kata that was uh, that was super easy. Tonight's will be a little bit more interesting. But you know, uh, and so then I encourage you to go into this experiment this week, and if you want to choose next week also um, to see if it is is more productive and acknowledge and, and realize though that it's not just like productivity here in the moment it's about making an overall more resilient and productive team uh, oh what happens when you get a mob of introverts um you know even introverts you know like being around people sometimes and yeah it, it can be exhausting um you know, I, I understand the, and I think this is something that, uh, again, I think they have a podcast about this. Um, we, we all have our, our, our natural tendencies when it comes to how we communicate and how we receive communication. And, uh, and introversion and extroversion are, are real. Um, and it takes a, a certain amount of, uh, of, of courage and skill to, um, uh, to be able to engage in this and and tonight and, and and next week that's part of the the activity part of the learning is you know for someone who especially after two years of being locked down you know isn't used to interacting with other people or you know uh, or finds it exhausting to have to like listen to all the ideas and everything like that um, you know here here again uh, with you know if, if the goal is to have uh, High quality software developed by cross functional teams that are are resilient and can support the uh, the the uh, the software for for many years to come um, it may require people to flex into it, it, it might require introverts to flex into putting more of their ideas out there it might also require extroverts to shut up right and that's the other side of of this where it's like okay if you are the driver if your hands are on the keyboard the way it's supposed to work is that someone really tells you what to type that can be really hard for someone who's like i know what to do no i should be it's like no no your role is to be the hands for the team and really it's the rest of the team that is then you know saying actually well the rest of the they didn't really show it there in the video but if you go and read about ensemble programming what they say is that there's really one primary navigator who then sort of takes the advice of the crowd and says okay nope this is what you know this is what we should type this is what the name of the class should be this is what the test should do
So anyway, so this is where, yeah. No, the driver is the person who's typing. The navigator is, and we saw this in pair programming a little bit too. And, and, I, and I realize I should probably provide some better background on this because we are really investing a lot in this course for, for doing this. But yeah, the, the whole idea of the navigator and driver role is that the, the driver is the person whose hands are on the keyboard and the navigator is the person who's thinking about the problem, thinking about the solution and advising. Um, and sometimes even eh, directing is probably too strong a word, is, is coaching the, uh, the, the driver towards what to, what to type and how to say it. And then you switch, right? And so then this is something that, as you saw in the video, they took turns. And what this does is it helps build a healthy group dynamic. It keeps people from being exhausted. It keeps some of them from dominating. Again, the extroverts, right? You know, and so it's like, no, your turn to like sit down and be in the back and watch and listen for a change. See how you like it, huh? huh? Right? So, it, yeah, it, you know, it, it requires um, stretching on everybody towards a greater goal of, um, of a more resilient team. Okay. Yeah, team driven development, right. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a bunch of people all working on the on the same problem. Okay. So tonight what we're going to do is we are going to break up into uh into two mobs and two ensembles of I don't know, four or five people. So I'll probably create uh, a handful of waiting rooms. But before we do that, and we're going to all work on a uh, on a kata, the RPN calculator kata. So this is a uh, a program that will uh, compute uh, arithmetic expressions written in what's called reverse Polish notation. I don't know if you've encountered this before. Um, it's a pretty common thing in computer science. Uh, so it's like if you ever use an HP calculator from like the olden days, uh, basically what you do is, uh, RPN is, um, is a postfix notation, meaning that the operator uh, occurs after the operands. So, um, so for instance, the expression 25 slash is 20 divided by five, so the result is four. And of course you can change, chain these into larger expressions. You can say four, two plus three minus, uh, which ends up being four plus two, and then uh, take the four plus two, and that becomes the operand to, uh, so that'll be six, three minus, which ends up being three, right? So six minus three equals three. So uh, it's like a backwards list without the parentheses, yes. Um, anyway, and so then this kata is all about writing uh, a, a program that will take a line like this and, give you the result of four. Uh, for bonus points, you can add the square root operator and then max. Uh, but hey, for tonight, let's just see if we can get the, uh, the four basic math functions uh, working. Oh, and let me post this. I suppose it's in the, the assignment, but I'll post it, or it's on the web page, but I'll post it here also. Something else that, uh, oh, sorry, any questions about the, uh, the RPN calculator um, kata? Yeah. Oh, right, sorry, yes. Uh, just like the pair programming, there will be, a, there is a reflection, um, which is, I think, due to, Two weeks, three weeks, one, two, oh gosh, we're also in August. No, that's due in two weeks, right. So we have the, the, uh, the pro mob programming from tonight, we have mob programming for next week, and then the week after that, the reflections is due. It's basically the same thing, but with mob programming. Yep. Before we break into mobs, just one more thing. So um, last week for the second pair programming, um, there, uh, one of the things that I didn't stay on top of was uh, some of the struggles that people were having getting started with GitHub. Um, I, I sort of checked in after like 15 minutes and people were so oh, I haven't sent my repository yet. I'm like, oops, sorry. So um, I thought it would help um, if, if I created a, uh, oops, if I created a repository with lots of Kata projects. I don't know. 
Um, so uh, if your mob uh, gets together and no one has a, a GitHub repository um, that they want to use for the, the Kata, um, I created one for everybody. And uh, when you make a clone, um, let me know and I will add you as a collaborator so that you can push to it. Um, and basically this repository has, uh, has uh, Kata projects for each, for like RPN calculator, and we'll break up into uh, we'll break up, break up into rooms, and so you can choose the the project for your room, and it's got the entire Maven project right here, and you can just use that one if you so desire. We'll see, and hopefully that will allow people to get into programming the Kata and not spending so much time getting set up with uh, with GitHub. Okay. Any questions before we dive in? Okay, let's see, we've got 23 people. I will create four breakout rooms. I'll create five breakout rooms. That'll be four and a couple of fives. No, I'll do four breakout rooms. And I'll let participants choose. I will create the rooms. I'll open them up. So feel free to uh, please go to uh, a breakout room and uh, get started. I will, uh, I'll come and uh, walk through if anybody has any questions. Uh, we'll do this for, I don't know, an hour. Let's see here. Oh, we'll, we'll come back. Let's see, we're doing it for an hour. We'll come back at uh, no uh, later than nine o'clock, do a brief report out and then call it an evening. I am muted. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, okay, so uh, let's just take a couple of minutes here, um, and uh, and uh, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, talk about uh, what we experienced. This is our first opportunity to pair. Uh, sorry, to, to mob program. Um, and so what I'm just going to do is I'm going to ask. Uh, people uh, who are uh, remote to go first, and uh, I'll just uh, go room by room and ask someone to come off mute and just uh, to talk in general about what they did now, and I'll get the, the stuff working here too. So actually, if someone then from here on the room could get on the, the Zoom, but stay muted and everything, yep. Uh, cool, excellent. Okay, well, so room one was Dylan, Jacob, Nathan, Nicholas, and Shrestha. Uh, what was your experience like? What was it like coding together? How was it different from pair programming? Uh, what, 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 uh, what, what did you learn? What'd you like people to know? Oh, wait a second. I know why I can't hear anybody because I made the mistake of muting the, uh, room AV. So maybe here's someone, let me get the participants up. Somebody from, uh, room one, please come off mute. It looks like Jacob, look, you're off. Could you say a couple of things? Yeah, um, really enjoyed speaking you, with the room, and yeah. uh, it yeah. was nice to have everyone's perspective. I think with the pair programming, it was much more of a um, difficult, stressful experience, maybe. Uh, definitely the resources of a larger group was much more advantageous. Oh, interesting. Excellent, thanks. Anybody else from uh, room one like to uh, come off mute and share some of their experiences? I think it was just uh, kind of similar. Uh, it was just nice to have, uh, you know, so many people. So, you know, everybody would, uh, if one person don't, didn't know it, then, you know, somebody else would. So that was nice. Excellent. Yeah, cool, I, I got to learn new things for example, stack, how they work, because I have not worked on stack before. It was really helpful for me. Yeah. Cool, okay, yeah, stack-based implementation, very nice. Thanks, room one. Room two is Richard, Ben, Tacey, Lana, Camillo, and Yuri. So what were your experiences like uh, being in a mob? Well, personally, I was a big fan of the Tiki torches. <laughs> just kidding um 
uh, I really liked talking to everyone and getting their ideas, particularly because I haven't really used stacks a lot. So having someone else tell me, and here's how we can use it, um, helped to that. Also, I've always struggled to understand reverse polis notation, and I've probably only seen it two or three times in my life. So uh, again, having people to like talk about it with was really helpful. Nice, thanks for sharing that. Others from room two. What did you think about uh, mob programming and how it's compared to other kinds of uh, program that you've done? Richard? Yeah, it was uh, definitely a very interesting. And why I noticed is that unlike when I code on my own, it's a very steady like workflow. Since mm. you're trading off and there's so many people that are bouncing ideas or to like figure out how to take the next step forward. Like there's always someone who has an idea since we have so many people. So there's always, you know, we're always taking that next step. So it was just a very steady flow of workflow up until max. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going to say I haven't really tried it before. Uh, so I thought maybe, you know, it'd be kind of tough people talking over each other and everything. But it wasn't it was actually super, super smooth, like way smoother than I expected. It was fun. It's cool. Nice. Sorry, my voice uh, is a little messed up right now. And I would add to the until we got to Max that it was nice to have a bunch of voices when we got to Max, because if any of us had gotten to that on our own, we would have just had a breakdown over like what, how do I, how do I do this? Um, and so it was nice to have other people confirming that we were not insane. Yeah, so there's, uh, I'm pretty sure there is a bug in the, in the Kata when they give the example for, for Max. Uh, it appears to be a, a greedy operator, it won't take any, anything uh, to, its, to its left, and then the final example uh, makes it look like a binary operator. So it's, uh, it's a weird one, but you know, this is what happens sometimes, right? Sometimes specification is wrong or inconsistent. So uh, real life here. Cool, awesome, thanks room two. Room three, Alex, Anna, Jacob, Pam, and Vidya. What were your experiences mob programming? Well, I think it's, it's a very great chance to meet, uh, like to talk and interact with people and learn from them. And I see how people code and the uh, logic that they use. It's, it's very nice. Yeah. Cool. Others from room three, anything you'd like to contribute? Nope, that's okay. Room four, Brandon, Jui, Lakshmi, Leshi, Saeed, and sorry, Syed and, and Vincent. What were your experiences like? It was a fun experience. Uh, I believe it could have been much better if we were in person. Uh, making it online was like a little bit clinchy. Uh, IntelliJ gave us uh, gave it like a hard time, but uh, we almost got it done. So it was a quick. Uh, I can see it, we were productive enough, like as a team. Oh, a, uh, a comment posted by Vidya. It was spontaneous, unlike coding alone. Cool. Yeah, that's that's a good observation. I like that. Anyone else from room four have something like to contribute? Nope. Okay, I'm going to change the audio here in the room so we don't get feedback. Okay, uh, Alex, thanks for for joining. Uh, yeah, so yep, you're off mute. So uh, people here in the in, in the room, what were your experiences uh, like mob programming? What was it like in person? It was good. I, I thought we got to discuss a lot. We started with discussing the overall what we're going to do when we started doing it. And then we would like, we would kind of just have like really good back and forth using the whiteboard here and, and, and getting on the same page. It, it made me think of, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's like a theme or picture about code review and, and it's about the WTS per minute. So it's, it's going well, it's so bad because like from outside the room, there's a lot of these WTS that are a little, 
And it, I feel like we're we're hand, we're we're going through those now. Like it, I I imagine too, like explaining the thought process. Like like we we talked a lot about oh you know, using the queue or we, or using a stack which we use two stacks. And imagine having a conversation when all the code is done. And imagine we did something totally different. And then we have this big discussion, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, I guess we could have just done it like this." Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, I think the fact that we got to have that discussion and have this deep kind of discussion is really excited about it. Yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, uh, my kind of as what Brian was saying is is it was it's we were. Both fortunate and unfortunate enough, the last time we did this in pair programming to have three of us, but this time it felt um, more strongly connected. Uh, and we also had an additional person here named uh, Susan, who she actually uh, reminded, I think, all of us of like, this is how a stack actually looks like. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, was, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. It, it seemed like there was more, uh, there was definitely more synergy than in a normal pair programming experience, um, which kind of made me wonder what the point of diminishing returns is. It's like, do you, if you have a room with 12 people, is it just like, does it turn into just chaos? Like, where's the, where's, where's the optimal size? Yeah, you know, I don't know if there's an optimal size. It probably depends on the people. Twelve does seem a little large. Um, although if everybody's taking turns, you know, I, I think the examples that I've seen, it's like eight is about the biggest, but maybe it's something we can try sometime, right? You know, have a breakout room with twelve people and if you know six people are just sitting there twiddling their thumbs, we kinda know that it's uh, it's too much. Great. Excellent. Susan, is there anything you'd like to contribute? Um, yeah, I thought it was helpful to have have the visual whiteboard here in person for me. And then also just kind of to, uh, you know, like remind ourselves to like switch and get back, take turns and stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, oh, actually, it's your mute. Off. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, thank you, everybody, both here in the room and everybody. Uh, Sorry, wait a second. That was actually it was the reason there was an echo is because because going through my microphone. It was until I muted until we got that. So that's good. It's uh, I guess everybody's direction voice is directional. Um, and uh, no, th thank you for sharing all of that. That was uh, really interesting and insightful. And so then you know uh, build upon that in your reflections. Think more about it. Uh, you know over the, the the coming days we'll have another opportunity to uh, to do it next week uh, to do some uh, more mom programming. That's everything I've got for tonight. Any other uh, thoughts, questions, anything that came up before we break? Nope. Don't blame me. It's late at night. It's dark out now. Jeez, boy, gone are the days where it was like still light at 930. Okay, well, hey, have a great evening, everybody. Have a good week. Please be sure to post uh, questions on the Project 4 um, channel uh, on uh, on Slack as you have them. Um, uh, and uh, make sure you get those project threes in. I will uh, send them to the graders uh, shortly. See you all next time. Bye now. <laughs>